<laughs> so, thank you for that. Good evening, everybody. Uh, for those that are here uh, watching online, uh, we have an audience this time, so if, if you're giggling and talking in the background, it's, it's probably better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's just open up our service uh, in, a, in a word of prayer. Uh, uh, Adam, would you do the honors, please? Make it loud. Loud enough to be Father, well, Lord, thank you today for thank you for time. I ask Lord that you bless this word today. Lord, that uh, we listen to it carefully. Lord, and that we uh, take key things home with us and we uh, study it as well. Lord, I ask that you change us, Lord, and make us better serve for you and uh, change our lives. I pray for you with these things, I pray today. Amen. 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 Okay, I'll just give you some announcements. Uh, don't forget, we uh, have prayer nights on Thursday and Friday. The ladies' prayer night is at 6 o'clock if you can get in touch with, uh, with Lorraine. Uh, Friday prayer night is for the men at 6 o'clock and if you can get in touch with Jamie for that. Uh, we also have, uh, if you can't make it to church uh, for some reason, uh, uh, Sister Janet is willing to get in touch and, and FaceTime uh, so you can have a time of prayer uh, with uh, someone else. So if you can get in touch with Janet uh, for that, please. Uh, our Sunday services are as normal now, 10.30 uh, uh, and 6, 6 uh, p.m. Uh, for the evening services. We have 35 seats, you have to book them online uh, before you come. Uh, and also this week, the, the law is, it's changed again, that we've, uh, we've all got to wear masks. So you've got to turn up to church, you've got to make sure you wear a mask. Uh, and also, as uh, preachers, we're going to have screens. So. Uh, we're going to be protected from you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't forget as well, uh, every Wednesday service we're still going to keep live streaming. If you can't make Sunday morning service, I, I know the, the AM service is going to be live streamed as well. Uh, upcoming events on the 15th of August, we, we have a church picnic. I forgot to write the details. Pastor Bits, can you? Uh, it's, uh, we're going to start at 1 o'clock. Yeah. Uh, if everybody brings their own picnic, their own food, their own chairs. Yeah. We, the church, will provide the tables, we'll put them out, yeah. out and also the, the drinks and the dessert. Okay. Uh, and uh, just some prayer requests, if you could keep the Pine family in, in your prayers and, uh, and also the Gritties in Spain, uh, keep them in your prayers as well. Uh, and I think that's everything for now, so I've forgotten anything. Anybody? Oh yeah, uh, don't forget to pray for Joseph, he broke his wrist, uh, trying to raise his little brother, and he lost. <laughs> <laughs> now if you could just pray for Joseph, and just uh, keep, keep, keep him in prayer. Um, so we're going to continue our question and answer sessions, but then we've got a live audience, so we can uh, talk a little bit more, so that you guys at home, if you're hearing anything backwards and forwards, it's people in the audience, and if you can't, if they speak too quiet, I'll, I'll say it loud enough so that you can hear as well. Uh, Let's just uh, pray then, get into the study. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this time. And, and Lord, we just ask that you can be with us now as we look into your word. And Lord, the questions that are coming, Lord, that they'll be edifying. Lord, that they'll be a strengthening to our faith. And Lord, that they'll be a, a blessing to us as well. We just ask that you be with us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I was going to start a new series on something this week. Uh, but some more questions came in, so I thought I'd answer these questions. And... Uh, I'll, I'll, I want to start something new, and as of yet, I'm glad the question's come in because nothing really came to mind. So I have I have something in mind, but it's a big, big series, and uh, so we'll see. Anyway, so today we're going to be talking about prayer. We had quite a few questions coming on prayer, and uh, a question came in that says, "This does God hear the prayer of unbelievers? Does God hear the prayer of unbelievers?" And the reason they're asking that was because they had family members that were saying that they'd been praying to God uh, that they'd get a job, and, and they got a job, and so God answered the prayer, and these were unbelievers, uh, and, and sort of questions like that. I'm, I'm sure we, we get that in our lives as, as Christians where people say, well, I pray to God. Does God hear the prayer of unbelievers? Uh, before we get into it, does anyone uh, have any ideas about this? Anybody think that God... Answers the prayer of unbelievers, Luke? Not about answer, but it definitely hears Yeah, he definitely hears it, and I think we can start out with that for definite, because God hears everything that goes on, so that, that's true. Anybody else? Jamie? I guess it depends what the prayer is. Yeah. I mean, if it's a you know prayer of salvation, then obviously the, 
the Holy Spirit is 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 working there and convicting. Yeah. And God would, you know, if, if someone asks, you know, Jesus, uh, if they admit that they're a sinner, they you know they believe in Jesus and confess their sins, then obviously God answers that prayer. Yes. But about all of them, I don't. I don't think He answers all of them. Yeah. So prayers of salvation. Uh, the normal response is found in John chapter six verse thirty one. And it, it, say, it says this, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a, a worshipper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. So it, it's kind of implying there that God doesn't hear sinners from that one verse. But when I was, did a bit of research on this, some people were saying there's actual passages in the Bible where God does listen to sinners. And we'll look at some, and I don't think that it, they are prayers, but we're, we're going to look at them anyway. Uh, first of all, understand this, God can answer the prayer of, of anyone if he wants to, because God is God, he's omnipotent, uh, he can do what he wants to do, as long as it's according to his will. Uh, and so sometimes it might even appear that God's answering a prayer, it could be part of God's plan. Uh, so God can do what he, what he wants, God is sovereign. But does God answer simple prayers of the unbeliever, like things like, you know, help me to get a job, God, you know, if... if an unbelieving friend of yours starts praying that he can find some work or he wants to get a better education or he wants to win the lottery. Uh, is God going to answer those sort of prayers? And some people came up with some scriptures showing you examples of unbelievers that come to God asking for answers of prayer. There's an example in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 21 through to 28. We'll go there in a second. And if you remember, there was that Syrophoenician Greek woman who came to Jesus and asked Jesus if he would heal her daughter. And you remember the, there was a bit of a conversation backwards and forwards and Jesus says it's not fit to give the, the, the children's food to dogs. And really what Jesus was referring to there was when he, when he referred to her as a dog, he wasn't saying because of her race, it wasn't because of anything else, but the fact that uh, she came from an area that practiced paganism. And she was a Gentile. And so implying that she was a pagan. And so some people say, well, Jesus answered that prayer and therefore answered the prayer of this unbelieving woman. A another example that's given in the Gospels is in Matthew chapter 8. The centurion came to Jesus. His servant was sick and said, will you heal my servant? This was a Roman and Romans were pagans. And Jesus healed and answered that prayer, if you like, or that request. Another example that's given in the Bible is found in John chapter, sorry, John, the book of Jonah. You remember that Noah, Noah, not Noah, <laughs> Jonah was sent to Nineveh, uh, to that great city, the big city of Nineveh, and, and God was going to judge that city. And if you remember, he went there to preach and he didn't want to go there, and he got swallowed by the whale, and then he got spat out, and... Uh, he ended up having to go there to preach. But it tells us that the Ninevites prayed to God and the Ninevites were pagans. Okay. Uh, another example would be Hagar. You remember Abraham uh, said his wife, well, his wife pestered him and said, you've got to get rid of that woman, send her away. And you remember Hagar was, was thrown out, basically, with, with Ishmael. And they were wandering in the wilderness or in the deserts and they couldn't find any water. The water had run out and it looked like they were going to die. And it says that God answered their prayer. We know that Hagar was a pagan. Even though she was in the house of Abraham, <coughs> she still kept her Egyptian roots. We know that because when she came to get find a wife of Ishmael, she never tried to find a Jewish wife or a wife of the covenant. She found an Egyptian wife for him. Uh, uh, Cornelius the centurion in the book of Acts you remember Peter went to his house it tells us that God heard him speaking these are some examples that people give uh, saying that sinners pray to God and God answered their prayers so let's just see whether or not that's really what the Bible teaches so can God answer the prayer of the unbeliever apart from salvation well like we said God is sovereign and he can do whatever he wants God can, if he chooses, to answer a prayer of an unbeliever. But what we'll find, to the best of my knowledge, we don't see any examples of that in the Bible. Even the examples we've just seen, we're going to see that they're actually not answered prayers of unbelievers. 
Does God answer simple prayers of the unbeliever like helping people to get a job? Uh, I don't think so, unless it's to do with God's will for some other purpose, as we see. You know, sometimes in the Bible we see uh, examples where God answers simple requests, like yes and no requests. Uh, you ever heard of Urim and Thummim yeah. in the Bible? You remember the high priest had a breastplate and it had 12 stones on the breastplate. Mm -hmm. And these were precious stones, all representing the tribes of Israel. And you could ask God simple yes and no answers. And what would happen is the, the stones would light up for yes or no. And they were just simple yes and no answers, simple requests like that. And we see it as well in the, in the Bible, something called casting of lots. You ever heard of the casting of lots? And it was basically there would be two stones in a, in a tub that was shaken and then one of the stones would fall out, different coloured stones or different names on a stone. And God would answer the prayer or the request purely through those sort of means. But these are yes and no answers. And sometimes prayers like that, Lord, will you help me to get a job tomorrow? To yes and no answer, I either get the job or I don't get the job. And so an unbeliever might pray that prayer and say, Lord, tomorrow can you help me to get a job? Um, and that person gets the job. Now, what does the unbeliever think if he gets the job? He believes in his mind that God's answered his prayer. Well, there's only two options there, isn't there? So, you know, does that mean every single time an unbeliever prays and asks God to, to do something for him and the yes and no simple answers, and, and it's 50-50, it could just be pure chance that that person's getting the job, not because God's got them the job, but because of this. And so there's sometimes simple yes and no answers. So it, sometimes it happens, it would appear as if God's answered the prayer, when in fact they got the job because they were the right people for the job, or they never got the job because they weren't the right people for the job. Brother Michael, you put your hand up. Just. No, no, carry on. Okay. But then we've also got to remember that God has a general care for mankind, for people in general, all sorts of people. In Acts chapter 14, if we go there, Acts chapter 14, verses 15 through to 17. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking uh, to a multitude of people that were pagans that didn't know the Bible. And in chapter 14, verse 15, he says this in saying, Sirs, why do you do these things? You remember they're trying to sacrifice to them, thinking that Paul and Barnabas were gods because they've done a miracle. And he says, We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. But listen to this verse. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good, and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons and filling our hearts with food and gladness. God is a good God. He gives us good things. You know, especially as a farmer there, we see some good examples for him. Fruitful seasons, rain from heaven. And so you can imagine an unbelieving farmer, if he was praying to God, God, give me good rain, that the harvest will grow. And the rain comes, and to him it might as be as if God's answering that specific prayer for him. But is God answering that prayer? Or was God just making it rain anyway? You know, it really doesn't answer the question. But one thing we do know is that God is good to everyone. All of us have got to recognise and notice. He says as well in that verse, uh, where, where is it now? Uh, it says in verse 17, Nevertheless, he has left not himself without witness. These things are evidences of God. What part of God are evidences? It says the good things. What it proves is that God is good to us. You know, God lets it rain so that harvest can grow, that we can have food, that we can have seasons. These are all evidences that God loves us. You know, the fact that we can have husbands and wives that we love, families that we care for, that we can have food on the table. These are all evidences that God is a good God. Now, speaking of loving enemies, in the Bible, Jesus said this, that you may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. He says, For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So what we're learning here is that God, if take prayer at the question, God is good to us. Even the people that dislike him, the enemies, people that actually are against him, 
but he's still good to them. And so sometimes it's not necessarily a prayer that God's, you know, he's like he's looking after the unbelievers because they're praying. He's good to them anyway. Like he's good to everybody. He's good to all people. And so in addition, things happen that appear to be answered prayer, but really they're happening because it's part of God's goodness. But also it might be God's will, but not for the unbeliever. Let me explain what I mean. You imagine a farmer praying for rain to come for the harvest. Well, God might make the rain come, not to answer his prayer because the harvest is for a greater purpose somewhere else. It could be for some other complete reason. Uh, you know, someone praying for someone to get well, an unbeliever, and that's usually when unbelievers call upon God, when times are hard, when someone's ill. So they're praying to God, saying, God, answer this prayer, and that person might get better, not because of the answered prayer, but really because in the future God might use that person for some other cause or for some other reason. It might be that that person gets better so that when the rain comes, the crops grow, and God uses those crops for someone else. You know, you just don't know really what God's plans are. You know, they're unfathomable. You know, we'll never really understand them. His ways are not our ways, as the scripture says. But let's look at some of the Bible examples that were given. You remember the Canaanite woman that came and requested to Jesus that his, her daughter be healed. And Jesus says it's not fit to give the dogs the crumbs. Uh, feed the food of uh, the children to the dogs. And she says, Do you remember the response? Anyone remember the response? What she said? I didn't eat the dogs eat the table. Yeah, even the dog eat the crumbs from the table. And, and really, what he's saying is that the blessings of God are really for the Jews at this time, for the believers, people who want to believe in me, but not for pagans. But even pagans and other world religions still get things from God. If you read any religion from around the world, what do they have in common with us? All sorts of rules and regulations, the same we have. You know, love God, love your neighbour, you know, do good to others. Those are all common things in every single religion. But look at her response, chapter 15 of Matthew, verse 28. It says, Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt, and her daughter was made whole from that very hour. What did we learn there? She wasn't a pagan. She might have come from the area where pagans were, but she came, and it's Jesus says, you have not just faith, but what? Great faith. You're a believer. This was a believer that was asking a request from Jesus, and Jesus was really putting her test, her faith, sorry, to the test. And you remember the centurion that came to Jesus and says, will you heal my servant? And you remember, it, there was this back and forth conversation with Jesus and the centurion. And he says, look, I'm a man in authority. And if I say to this man, go and do, he goes and does it. And if I say to this man, fetch this, he'll fetch this. And G he says to Jesus, just say the word. What was he demonstrating there? Faith. He wasn't a pagan. He might have been a centurion, but he wasn't a pagan. It tells us in Matthew chapter 8, verse 10, And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them, That follow, the very I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Not only was this man not a Jew, he was a, a Roman, but he, he, Jesus says that in all of Israel, he hadn't found a man that believed as much as this man did in his faith, in all of Israel. So this man was asking out of faith. That means he was a believer. And you remember the people of Nineveh? And, and you remember uh, Jonah gets there and he preaches the message. And in Jonah chapter 3, verse 5, listen to what he says. So the people of Nineveh believed God. They believed the message and proclaimed the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. So what does that tell us? That they got saved. They gave their life to the Lord. And then for the next so many verses, it tells us that they even, you know, put all the animals away. No one did any work. Everyone was just fasting and praying to God, asking God to take this thing away. And these are acts of faith. You remember the story of Hagar? When you actually see the story, Hagar never prayed at all. It says she just cried aloud. The lad never prayed at all. He cried aloud as well. Uh, and the context, if you go back a little bit further in Genesis chapter 21, verse 12 and 13, this is before it even happened. 
It says, And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, because you remember he's going to send him away, and because of thy one woman. In all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And so he's saying, Listen to what your wife's saying, send her away, and don't let it be grievous, <laughs> don't let it bother you, okay, don't let it weigh you down. But then he says this, and also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. And so what we're learning there is that really they were saved, not because of their prayers, but because of the faithfulness of Abraham. And because of the covenant that God made with Abraham, it was God's covenant. Remember the seed promise was through Isaac, but it still made promises through Ishmael as well. And God's got to keep his promises. And so to the outside, it looked like a prayer was answered because they might have prayed. But really it came through the believer. The blessing came through the believer. And you remember the other example, Cornelius the centurion in Acts chapter 10. Peter went to his house. God told him, go to this man's house. But in Acts chapter 10, verse 2, listen to how God describes him. A devout man and one that feared God. With all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He was referred to, really, as the Jews would say, the people of the gate. Now, these were believers, Gentiles, who believed in God, but never wanted to be circumcised. So they wouldn't go past, they couldn't go into the temple. So they would go as far as the gate, the people of the gate. But they were still believers. This man was a faithful man, a man who believed. And so, really, we see the examples that people use to say that God will answer the prayers of unbelievers. That in all cases, they, they were either believers or that God was answering a, a, another believer's prayer on their behalf. So what does the Bible say? So the Bible, the Bible or the Lord, makes it clear He will only answer, answer certain prayers of unbelievers. Only certain prayers of unbelievers. First of all, those who seek God... Now remember, we always say those who call upon God for salvation, that's the second, we'll look at that in a moment. But I believe that God will answer the prayer of those who earnestly seek God. So if you have an unbeliever that wants to know God and is seeking God, do you think God will answer the prayer of that unbeliever? And I'm talking about this finding God. I'm not talking about his answering the prayer of, can you get me a job tomorrow? But seeking God, God will answer the prayer of seeking. Uh, we know that God exists. Uh, so these are people who kind of come to an idea or, or a knowledge that God exists without the word. I'll give you an example. Romans chapter 1, verse 19. It says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. And so the Bible tells us that there's an inner witness of God within us. Uh, in Ecclesiastes it says, every man has eternity in his heart. We all want to live forever. None of us want to die. But we also have this yearning to want to know who God is. And, and really what happens is over time, people who harden their hearts to God, that dies, it starts to be seared, because it's really an element of the conscience. So God has showed it unto them, he says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And so what we see there is that even without the scriptures, Without anyone witnessing to anybody, we can know that God exists from the creation of the world. I'll read it again. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. So when we look at the universe into the world uh, that we live now, it, it proves that God exists. And that might be enough for someone who's earnestly seeking God. They might look at these things and conclude that there's got to be a God. And then they start praying and seeking God. Do you think God will answer that prayer? Reveal yourself to me. You know, now I've been doing some studies with Luke over here and we've been looking at this. This is what we call general revelation. Uh, what we look at in the world, what we genuinely see, and Brother uh, Tony is already talking about it. What we genuinely see, this is not special revelation, this isn't God revealing himself in a supernatural way. But we can look into the world and we can see God. And, and, and what's happening is this, the more we get in, the more advanced we're becoming in science, the more we're beginning to see that the universe 
And the world that we live in is more complex than we even thought from yesterday. Mm -hmm. The more powerful the microscopes we get, the more we're beginning to see how detailed the cell is. The, the larger the telescopes, we're beginning to see how complex the universe is. And so with the advances of science, it's actually doing no favours for evolution. It's doing the opposite. It's actually showing us that the world, the universe, is designed, finely tuned to perfection. And so anyone who's seeking God by just looking at those things, and it can happen. I know people, Luke here for example, at the back, you ask him his testimony. He looked at the world and he began to see the wickedness in the world and how it was always aimed against God and against Jesus Christ. So it, it caused him to seek God. And so when he started to pray and ask God to reveal himself, what happened? He revealed himself. You know, when Luke walked into this church, he'd already given his life to the Lord. He'd never been to a church. Never heard uh, any of us preach here or we've never been witnessed to by another Christian. But why? Because he sought God. And so I do believe that God will answer that sort of a prayer. Amen. If an unbeliever is genuinely seeking God, God will reveal himself. Uh, we see in the Old Testament as well, in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13, and, and this is talking about the Jews being dispersed over the world. You know, the Bible tells us that the Jews are under judgment at the moment because of the dispersion. But God says, one day I'm going to bring them back. And it says in Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, And you shall seek me and find me. This is in their unbelief. When you shall search for me with all of your heart. And that's the thing, you know, when an unbeliever seeks God with a genuine heart, with genuineness, with truthfulness, they really want to know what the truth is. I believe that God will answer that prayer. But there's also the second one, and the one that we all know. The other prayer that we know God will answer is the one, the call of salvation. Romans 10, 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, now keep in mind, before you're calling upon the name of the Lord, you're not, you're not saved until you do that. So if you call upon the name of the Lord and you're an unbeliever, and, and it says, call upon the name of the Lord. He says, you shall be saved. You shall be saved. And so those are the prayers that we know for a fact in the Bible where God will answer prayer. Now, it might be that God appears to answer prayer, but everything works according to his will. And he's sovereign. And so I'm, I'm, I'm in no place really to say that God can't answer anybody's prayer. You know, God, God, God is God. And what he chooses to do, he chooses to do. But the examples that are given really are only seeking and, and, and salvation. And this kind of led on to another question. Are there times when a believer's prayer will not be answered? What about us? Is there times when God won't even answer our prayers? When he won't even hear us? Depends on your walk, really, doesn't it? Depends on your walk. Anybody else? If you're praying for something stupid, then yeah. If you're, if you're praying for something that's just not right, yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean by don't don't tempt God. Yeah. With things that are just silly. Yeah. Don't waste His time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't waste God's time. The objections people would say to this is God is love, and He'll never push away His children like this. His throne is always open for you at any time and for anything. And some Christians believe that. That you can constantly go before God's throne and ask for anything at any time. And he loves us and it doesn't matter what we do, how we live our life. He's always going to give us what we want because we're his children. But is this true? Mm -hmm. no. The Bible gives us many reasons and examples of when he will not answer prayers for the believer. Let me just give you a few. Some spiritual reasons for an answered prayer. James chapter 4 verse 3 says this. You ask. And receive not, meaning you pray, because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. Mm. Now sometimes we ask for prayer or specific things of God and we're asking with the wrong motive, mm. for selfish reasons. You know, I want to win the lottery or something yeah. like that. Or it, it could be anything, but if it's for the wrong reason, then God's not going to answer that prayer. 
James gives the example to consume it upon your lusts. That means your own personal desires. It, you, it's not what God wants, it, it's what you want in your life. Well, God's not going to answer a prayer like that. Another example would be uh, Psalm 66, verse 18. It says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Holding on to sin. You know, some Christians hold on to sin for years. And we know it's wrong, but we continue in sin. And then we go to God in prayer. And then we wonder why our, our life is unblessed and unfruitful. And it's all because we're holding on to something that we should let go of. Uh, I, was, I was in the gym, I think it was Monday, and someone came up to me and says, do you recognise me? You know, do you ever get that? Mm -hmm. Do you recognise me? And I'm like, I, I, I thought, I'd seen him in the gym, I thought, I'd recognise him from somewhere, but... And he said his name, and, and uh, I know his partner, and she, she used to live over here. We did it at the funeral for the partner's father, uh, Gus, who was over here. And uh, it, we got talking a little bit, and then later on, as I was walking around the gym, I was working out, and he was next to me talking to somebody else, and he was telling him all his life problems, what was wrong with his life, and he says, I just want to change. And I want to, you know, he says, I just, I, I'm almost there. I can feel like I'm on the verge of changing. And what's interesting was when I was doing the funeral, which is about six years ago, he was telling me the same thing in the house. And I'm thinking, six years have passed. I haven't had a chance to talk to him yet. Uh, but six years have passed and nothing's changed for you. Sometimes Christians can be that way. That we can get stuck in sins and our life doesn't move on. There's, there's no growth. There's no movement in our Christian life. You know, I, I always say this, that there should never be any standing still in the Christian faith. There's either going forward or the backsliding. We, we should always be moving forward. And so holding on to our sin can stop really our relationship with God or hinder our relationship with God, I should say. Another one is this, asking without faith. James chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, it says, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. But let no man that think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Do we really believe him? That's what he's saying. When you go in before him and you're just praying and we're just doing a shopping list, we, we get into those things that sometimes we have lists of prayer and we and we do shopping lists. But do we really believe that God is capable of answering these prayers? Because if we don't, it's empty words. It, it, it's no faith. It's no different than an unbeliever speaking to God. There's no faith there. There's no belief that God's going to make or accomplish thing, this thing to happen. Another what reason God won't answer our prayers? Praying not according to his will. Uh, 1 John 5. And this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. We have to pray according to his will. Now, how do you pray according to his will? You've got to get close to God. You've got to walk with him. You've got to be in tune with him. You've got to be listening to what he's saying. And, and then you'll know the directions that you have to go in life. And you know the decisions that you have to make. And so when you pray, you pray according to his will. You need to get to know the Word. The Word is Him speaking to you. And so that's how you get to know who He is and what He wants. So we don't pray amiss. We don't ask Him for things that later on we read in the Bible. Oh, I shouldn't have prayed that. Have you ever done that? Or you've asked for things and thought, oh, I didn't know that was in the Bible. And you've been praying for the wrong things. So you've got to get to know Him. Many more reasons are given in the Bible. We could list, I'll just list them off. Those who remain in sin. Those who offer unworthy service to God, those who forsake God, those who reject, God, reject God's call, uh, those who will not heed to God's law, who turn a deaf ear to, uh, to the cry of the poor. If you, hear, you, know, if you can help someone and you refuse to help them, Scripture says God won't hear your prayers. Those who are violent, those who worship idols, and when we say worship idols, it doesn't necessarily mean you're bound down to a statue, it just means that your life is consumed with something and it's more important than God's. 
and it could be anything. Those living in hypocrisy, the proud of heart, the self-righteous, those who mistreat God's people. And I'm sure we could find more lists. And the simple answer is this. If you're not walking right with the Lord and you don't have a heart like his, then your prayer life is going to be hindered. You've got to be right with God. And when you're right with God, you pray for the right things. And when you're right with God and you pray for things and the, the prayers aren't answered, you're patient with him because you know that God will answer them if it's according to his will. But you've got to be right with God. Your desires will be his desires, not your desires. You'll want to know what his will is and not what your will is. And so, yes, there are times when God will not answer our prayers, but really it comes down to our walk with him. It's nothing wrong with him, it's us. And the Bible says all we have to do to put those things right is confess to him. That's a prayer we will answer. He'll answer every time. If we come with the right heart and the right attitude uh, of repentance, God will answer that prayer every single time. And just in conclusion, uh, I just want to tell you what it means to be in constant fellowship with God. Because we talk about it a lot, walking in the Spirit and things like that. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, the Apostle Paul talks about walking in the Spirit. But in verse 19, listen to what he says. Speaking to yourselves, not, not to anyone else, speak to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's how you do it. You, you think on positive things of God, the psalms, the hymns that we know. You know, it's so often we can memorise a song in the world. You know, I play the guitar and sometimes I'll work a song out. And, and sometimes it's quite easy, it just happens and I've memorised the words to that song. But how many of us memorise hymns? How many memorise Christian songs? How many of us memorise psalms or passages of scriptures that we can think on, that we can meditate on? And this is what it says, it says, speak to yourselves in this. You're not speaking to anyone else. You're not even speaking to the Lord in this. You speak to yourself. What does he mean? You're reminding yourself. You're reminding yourself of who you are and, and why it is that you know God. And then he says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're struggling in your faith, do this. Number one, examine yourself. See whether or not there's something wrong. It could be that you've got a sin. A sin against somebody else, a sin against God, a personal a habit that you've got that you need to break. You know, that's always the first place you start in with yourself. And put it right with God. Ask for forgiveness for it. And, and pray what David prayed. Return to me the joy of my salvation. And then start doing these things. Find a hymn. Sing it. Find a psalm and read it. But I like what it says in verse 20. It says, give him thanks always. Have you ever tried that? Just try one day where you just give thanks for everything that you have. Like I said earlier, God is good. And he gives us so many things and that we take, we really take for granted. Mm -hmm. um, it, it says in, in um, all of Paul's letters, whenever you read them at the very start, he writes to the Romans, to the Corinthians, does anyone know what's always there in prayer? It's, he always says it in the first few verses. Pardon? Greetings. Greetings. He gives thanks. Hello? Pardon? He gives thanks. He gives thanks. Look how he says it. Romans chapter 1 verse 8. It says, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. And then he goes on to say that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Just try that one day. Make sure you write with the Lord and start praying every single day or just, just try for one day. You'll see how much it changes you as a person. Just say, start praying to the Lord because the Bible says pray without ceasing. And anyone that comes to mind, think of positive things about them. You know, Lord, I thank you for my wife. 
You know, she got my clothes ready last night, so thank you, Lord. And she's, she's such a blessing to me in my life. And when you do that, you become a better person. It changes your character. It changes the way that you deal with other people. You know, when something negative comes along, try to think something positive out of it, something good out of it, something godly out of it, instead of a negative thing all the time. He says in 1 Corinthians 1, keep in mind the Corinthian church, how terrible it was. He says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. He couldn't really say much good about them when he says, God give me grace. <laughs> Yeah? In Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Try that one. So anyone that comes to mind, thank God for them. Anyone? He says, always in every prayer of mine for you, always making requests with joy. You know, that's how you live and walk with God. You're praying to God, you're seeking God all the time and having a joy with the Lord. And then everybody, especially the brethren, the brothers and sisters, you're thanking God for them all the time. Everything will change. Your love for God will change and your love for your brothers and sisters will change as well. So let's not concentrate too much on, what, on, the, on the prayers that God won't answer. Mm -hmm. And think about the prayers that God's going to answer. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. And Lord, we put the challenge out to ourselves that Lord, we spend the day giving thanks for everything. Or even the most insignificant things like butter on our toast. Lord, we just give thanks for everything. Thanks for our food. Thanks for the houses, the family, the, the people that we know, the vehicles that we have, the weather that we have, the situations that we find ourselves in. Lord, help us to be thankful people. Help us to be people not to think about the negative things of life. And Lord, I know that... Uh, we sometimes talk, you hear people in the world talking about positive thinking, Lord. Real positive thinking is thinking on you, thinking on your word, and just giving thanks. And Lord, we just ask that you can be with us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.